our New Testament reading, again, comes from the gospel according to John, first chapter, first through 18th verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But who all received him, who all believed In his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, but of, or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we, all ha- we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. God's word for God's people, and God's people said Amen. Uh, You may be seated. I want to talk a little bit about this first Sunday of the new year, uh, the man and the mission. The man and the mission. My mother always tells me that the way you start something is the way you finish. I've heard the adage that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Uh, Being a sound engineer by trade, I used to intern at a record label, and then I also had an opportunity as a sound engineer to work with a lot of people who make decisions when it comes to music. And one thing that I've noticed about some of these decision makers when it comes to music, your vice presidents, your A&R reps, your producers, your executive producers, they listen to a lot of music. But when they listen to all of this music, they usually only listen to it about 12 to 30 seconds because they know in the beginning of that song they have heard all they need to hear about those those first 12 or 30 seconds to know whether or not that song is going to be any good or not. I've seen music directors take the first song of a concert and make that their most hardest hitting song. When you go to plays, the opening act is to grab your attention. I guess what I'm trying to say in all of these different examples is that introductions are important. Uh, This passage that I read for your hearing is considered the prologue to the gospel according to John. And for those who do not know, I'm a little partial to the gospel according to John because I had a teacher that was partial to the gospel according to John. Extra credit on our final exam and our midterm uh, for both classes of New Testament were which gospel was the best gospel and the answer was A, the gospel according to John, B, the gospel according to John, C, the gospel according to John, and D, the gospel according to John. I'm a little partial to John and I'm partial to John just from what I've learned of it, but this is the prologue of the gospel. And see, when you talk about introductions, uh, you have the gospel according to Mark, that gets right to the introduction of his 
ministry, Jesus, that is, is the beginning of his ministry. It gets started right there. It hits the ground running. And then you have, so that's one beginning. And then you have uh, the gospel according to Matthew and Luke. And they talk a little bit about when uh, Mary was pregnant with Jesus and then also Jesus' lineage. So that's, that's a, a beginning as well. That's a bit of an introduction from the beginning. But the gospel according to John takes it back just a little bit further. It says, in the beginning. And when they talk about the beginning, they're talking about creation. Mm-hmm letting you know that Jesus was there from the beginning. So it's good to talk about the beginning of the ministry, and it's good to talk about the heritage as well and who he came from in the 42 generations that he came down, as it is often quoted. But the beginning, letting you know that Jesus was there at the beginning. The beginning, the beginning, the the real beginning before the world was formed when it's just him and God. That beginning, the beginning of it all. And so this man was here at the beginning, or this God was here at the beginning, this Jesus was here at the beginning, and it's Jesus. It covers his, the man first, Jesus, and his relationship to the Father. His eternality is declared in this because he's here at the beginning. If you're here before something is there, you're outside of that time. So when we talk about we're being Trinitarian, meaning that we believe that Jesus is God as well as God is God, and we believe that the Holy Spirit is God, in order for something for that to happen, he would have to have been there at the beginning. So Jesus is at the beginning where before the world was created, we're letting you know that Jesus was there. And we can go back to Genesis and we talk about let us make man. Mm-hmm. Who's us? Uh. Hmm. So his eternality is declared and Christ's deity is declared. God, he, Christ is there when God is creating the earth. And then it says, in the beginning was the Word, Mm -hmm. and the Word was with God. Mm -hmm. Right there, let us. Mm -hmm. And the Word was God. Mm -hmm. And I like that word, word, because in the Greek, it's used as logos. Let the church say logos. logos. Logos is Greek, and it designates God the Son as God. Jesus and Christ refer to his his incarnation, the fact that he's able to create things, his work. This is Logos, and Logos is so powerful because Logos has seeped its way outside of just our religion. There are other religions and philosophies and different things like that that understand the power of Logos. They may not come into a church and worship on Sunday. They may not do a whole bunch of other things. But they can't touch the logos, the word. It, 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 in some, some uh, philosophies, in some terms, it's used as logic and reason. It's also harmony. Some people have even tried to get super deep without getting religious and called it the universe. Logos is powerful, but we refer to it as the word. Logos grows across philosophies and religions and ideologies. Logos is everywhere. You cannot doubt the existence of Logos because to doubt the existence of Logos is to doubt the existence of existence itself. Uh, Logos is one, or Logos of the word, or God, as one person put it, is the uh, all-inclusive whole of all of reality. Hmm. Everything that has ever been created, everything that you think is real is a part of this. So it's really hard for you to say that God doesn't exist if everything that's a part of God exists. Hmm. That's like saying you don't exist. Can you say reality does not exist? Can you say the inclusive whole of all of reality does not exist? That does not make sense. But to doubt logos is, is the, uh, to doubt existence itself. That's the word. Logos also means, on one hand, it means to be with God. And, and in another hand, it also means to, be, to, 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 uh, to turn towards God. Uh, to even be face to face. Uh, so, in other words, it's a relationship. The word has a relationship. It's turned face to face with God. Now, I am guilty of this myself. I'm working on it. Y'all pray for me. But when you talk to people, sometimes you don't necessarily face them, make eye contact, turn to them, and show them the appreciation or the attention, your full attention. I'm working on this, but I understand that when you turn to somebody and you make face-to-face contact with someone, when you are facing them, that conversation is more intimate, amen? 
So here it is that the word logos, the word, means to turn towards or to be face to face with God. So it would, it would assume to mean that if we need to get a relationship with God, if we want to spend some time in God's face, we ought to spend some time in the word. Amen. Amen. It's much more intimate when you talk to somebody face to face. It's much more respectful when you're able to look at somebody and face them. That means you are giving them their attention. So if I want somebody's attention, I ought to be in their face. And so if I want God's attention, I ought to spend some time turned towards God in God's face. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And I harp on this time and time again, but we ought to know the Word. If we don't know the Word, how do we know what it is that we believe? If we don't know the Word, how do we know that I'm not up here making it up as I go along? Right. Right. Spend some time in the Word. And we have this relationship not only with the Father, but a relationship with the world. God is the sole creator, as it says in verse three. All, all three, all thing, three, sorry, all things came into being with him, through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. And then it goes on to say that he's the light and the life. His life gives life to everyone, and the darkness cannot extinguish it. We not only have to have a relationship with God, but we have to have a relationship with people. Uh, we, we, it's nice for us to have the word. It's, it's important for us to have the word, but then we ought to be able to take that word out into the community. Uh, the, this word where it says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it is a bit of a mistranslation. When you get down into the Greek, one of a better transliteration of it is understand mm, right. that the darkness did not understand it. Mm-hmm. So I would argue that it's our, turn, our understanding that if, we're, if we are to be the light in this darkness, we ought to be able to help the darkness understand it. Yeah. There are those out there that are searching for something, don't know what's missing in their lives, don't know what's going on with them. And it's for us to explain some of that to them, to show them what they're missing. Mm-hmm. So they're unable to under, overcome it because they don't understand it. So we're here to help them understand it. We're here to help them understand the word. But how can we do that if we don't spend our own time in the world? And so we have this relationship with the Father, and then we have this relationship with the world. And then we have, and that's, that's the man, and then there are men as well, and then we have uh, John the Baptist. John makes some key statements to people that he's to serve as the witness to Christ and that Christ is greater than him and Moses. And I like that word witness. I've learned to appreciate that word witness a lot more. I watch a lot of TV, probably more than I should, but that's all right. (laughs) And a couple of shows that I like to watch, NCIS, NCIS Los Angeles, and when it used to come on, CSI Miami, these are crime scene shows where these people go and investigate the crime scene and they figure out fingerprints and DNA and hair samples and they're able to, based on the evidence that was left from the scene, arrest the perpetrator. But the shows are fiction. They're based off of actual things. There is a such thing as an NCIS, and there is a such thing as a forensic crime department, and there is these certain things, and there is evidence whenever there's a crime, but there's another show I like to watch. First 48. First 48 actually follows around actual police officers doing actual investigations. And whenever they close a case within the first 48, They don't close a case based off of evidence. They close their cases based off of confessions. And not only do they close their their, their cases based off of confessions, but they close them based off of confessions and witness 
testimony. Being able to talk to somebody who's there. Being able to talk to somebody who saw what went on and that person be able to tell closes the case faster than picking up the scraps and the leavings. And so I like that word witness because we ought to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Yes, there is evidence all around us of God's existence, but if you have somebody able to witness to you, somebody able to tell you the story, they'll be able to tell you better than any of the leavings left behind. That first-hand testimony is a lot more easy to pick up than somebody trying to figure it out on their own based on what was left behind. So John bore witness to Jesus. He told him that somebody was coming, somebody that was better than him, somebody who was going to be able to save us and be the light to the world. He was a witness. And so those are some of the men in it along with the man. And then we have the miracle. The miracle, let the church say miracle. miracle. The miracle in verse 14 is that the Lord became flesh and dwelt among us. Here we have someone that was in eternity and decided to be like us. Decided to know what it was like to get cold and get hungry and get sleepy and get angry. Did all of those things, lived a life like us, because he had to become that which he intended to save. And I like that the word said dwelt, and in some translations it it became among us and these things, but in the Greek it literally means pitched a tent. Two things I, I, I like about this pitching a tent. Uh, It reminds me of the tabernacle, seeing the book of Exodus before the people of God had a temple and they needed a place to worship. They made a temporary place and it was a tabernacle and the tabernacle is where the glory came down. The tabernacle was like a tent, almost like our tent revivals of the day and the people would worship until glory came down. It meant it it is a temporary and, and not only that, but tents are temporary. When you put a tent down, you don't intend to stay there forever. It's only there to house something for a limited amount of time. And so Jesus dwelt among us. Jesus pitched a tent for a temporary time because he knew he was going to have to come back. But you left that tent there so that everybody could see how it was done. He lived a life that we could watch and learn from. God became a tabernacle for the people. And this was a place that God's glory came down. And then the glory not only came down in this tabernacle, but it came down in the human incarnation of Jesus. The living, breathing word of God, Jesus the Christ. The word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. That's what it was in this Christ Jesus glory. Glory literally means weight. So the king of glory will come in. So literally when it says those kind of things is that it's going to come to a point where God is going to throw his weight around. We know what it means if we don't to throw our weight around. That's when somebody who's in charge walks under the scene and makes things right. They say that that person threw their weight around. And nobody has more weight than Jesus. And so we wait for this glory because we wait for this weight to be thrown around, somebody to boss around and make things straight. Every valley shall be exalted. Every hill shall be made low. Every crooked place will be made straight. Throw that weight around. That's the man. And the man was sent here on a mission. He came to save sinners. He came to prevent us all from suffering death, hell, and the grave. That is what he came to do. He came to provide us a way into heaven. 
And some rejected him. And it says that even his own rejected him. And I like that it says even his own rejected him because a lot of people think that to be the Hebrew people rejected him. But it's a little more than that. Uh, Everything is God's. So not just a particular set of people rejected him, but they didn't understand him. And when they say that his own, they're referring to people from all of creation. And I find it funny, though, that even though some people didn't want to acknowledge him, that still does not make them any less his. And that still does not make him any less in charge. I could get mad, not that I would, but only for example, I could get mad and say that my mother is not my mother. And it doesn't matter how forceful I am with it or how emotional I am for it. She still gave birth to me in Freeport, Illinois, with the help of Dr. Godspeed, in uh, September 30th, 1980, in Freeport Memorial Hospital at 3.32 p.m. It doesn't change it no matter what I say. So as mad as, mad as somebody can get at God, as mad as somebody can get at he's still God, and he's still our creator, no matter how mad we get, no matter how many times we say you don't exist, he still exists. I can say my mama don't exist, but she's right here on the road. So his own did not understand him. But those who did, those who believed in him, will become the children of God. And that is what we are here for, to become the children of God. And then help others become the children of God. And then when we all become the children of God, we're supposed to act like the children of God and help other people become the children of God. That is what we are here for. To let people know about grace upon grace. Let them know that it's not just about the law anymore. But grace. Jesus lived a life we could not live. Died a death that we could not die. He became a perfect sacrifice for us. So that we could have access to the Father. That's what it is about. And it was started in the beginning. It was set from the beginning. Before we were formed, before we were a twinkle in our parents' eyes, before we were a thought, God had already set this into place. God has set it into place and all we have to do is follow. All we have to do is accept. Why? Because he loves us. That's love. That's love to... Get rid of your godly status for a while and come become a human when you could have been in heaven in glory all by yourself. That's love. That's love to be convicted of a crime you didn't commit. Be brought up in front of a jury on trumped up charges and have some of the same people that cheered for you want you to be crucified. That's love. That's love to be on a cross and say I thirst and be given vinegar to drink. That's love to willingly take on a crown of thorns and get beaten for people who wasn't even born yet, for people whose great-grandparents weren't even born yet, for people whose great-great-great-great-grandparents weren't even thought of. That's love. Knowing you have the ability to call thousands upon thousands of angels to come down and get you off the cross, but you don't. That's love. That's love to once once you say into my hands, I commit your spirit to go down and take the keys of hell away and come back with all authority in your hand. That's love. But you know what else is love? The fact that he's coming back again. That's love. He did it for love. And because he did it, he is both, as they say, fully human and fully divine. The the theosteanthropos, as they call it, which is a big old five dollar word for God, man. Amen. Has, has, has both godly characteristics and, and, and uh, human characteristics at the same time. 
uh, someone smarter than me by the name of Mendel came up with these laws of genetics that said that you are 50% both your mother and father at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so you may start off looking like your mother and then grow up and start looking at your father, look like your father. You may look like your mother and then have your father's temperament and these kind of things. So it's a mix of both. And so you have Jesus who is both God and man together. So you can have Jesus who is both God and man together and they be on a boat and the waves and the wind start rocking. And, 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 and the, the, the situation be bleak and you look over at the end of the boat and there's Jesus sleep. God doesn't sleep. The Bible says he neither sleeps nor slumber. God doesn't who is this sleep? <laughs> but then they wake him up and get master cares thou not that we perish. And he wakes up and he says, peace, be still. So he was, there, there's that human side of him that was asleep, but then there's that God side of him that says, peace, be still. God and man. God and man, there's word that your friend is getting sick. Mm, all right. And the man side of you might just be a little late getting somewhere. Might take your sweet time and get there and then when you find out mm. that they have passed away, mm. you mourn them like a man. All right now. But you both God and man, so the God in you would say, Lazarus, come forth. Yeah, yeah. Both God and man. God and man praying to have this cup removed from you. Yeah, yeah. But not the, nevertheless, my will, but your will be done. And Amen. then when the soldiers come, you might have a man around you that temper might be a little bit under, out of control. Mm -hmm. God and man, and this man chop this soldier's ear off. Yeah. But the God picks up that ear and puts it back on. Uh -huh. Amen. God and man together. The man can be celebrated mm -hmm. riding in on a donkey with people laying palms down and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. The man then get arrested on trumped up charges. The man can get crucified. But three days later, mm -hmm. all right. Three days later, mm -hmm. they rise again because he's the man that's on a mission, and his mission mm -hmm. is to save us all. For if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Mm -hmm. That's the mission. And we are going to continue the mission until the mission is accomplished in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. The doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come.